You're listening to the Listen Up Show Startup Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm Mitchell Chadro, your host. We're here with Fred Teal today on show 045. What you will learn on today's show, we talked to Fred to him about the Internet of Things, find out how he's actually created hundreds of millions of dollars in shareholder value. We've talked to him about smart systems and some of his companies like Teal Advisors, Lentronic, Information Technology. He talks to us a lot about staying connected and digitized assets and great partners. We also talk about local corporation. He tells us about some of his challenges and how he's actually been able to create value. He talks to us about products and solutions and how to actually be creative when it comes to developing your own solutions and your own products as it relates to connectivity and today's new, new economy. For today's show notes, head on over to MitchellChadro.com slash show 045 and allow Fred to help you with all of his expertise. For those who will connect with him directly to help them with their own ideas, their own products, their own solutions for a complimentary 30-minute telephone call. So at the end of the podcast, why don't you connect with Fred? Thanks again for this generous offer to our audience. Listen up, trusted friends. It's your business. It's your family. It's your life. Now let's get started. Please sign up to my email list for the latest special offers exclusive for our Listen Up Show Startup Entrepreneur Podcast audience at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. I have been providing business advice, resources, and help to entrepreneurs for over 20 years, and I'm looking forward to helping all of you. Sign up for my email list again at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. I will provide you with full transcript for each interview, my ebook, 30 Tools to Start Up, the Startup Checklist, and many other education and training materials, all back at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. Now enjoy the show. Thank you so much today for joining us on yet another Listen Up show and the Mitchell Chadro podcast, where it's all about startups, entrepreneurs, business owners, and those with careers who deep down inside, really do want to start up. And now, on to the show. We're here today on show 045 with Fred Teal. Fred, how are you doing? Excellent, thank you. How about yourself? Oh, I'm doing wonderful. No relation to Peter Teal, correct? Well, my oldest brother is Peter Teal, but he's not that Peter Teal. He's a different... Can you tell us how you've been able to basically create hundreds of millions of dollars in shareholder value for the companies that you've managed over these decades? Sure. It's um, really a question of understanding transformational value creation, which sounds like a mouthful, but it's really value in a company is created in a number of ways. It's not just top-line revenue. It's not just cash flows and EBITDA, but it's about strategic value. And how do you make a company really valuable so that a buyer feels that they need to pay a premium price for the company? So as an example, um, I got involved with a company a number of years ago um, called Lantronics. They were in the printer, server, and console serving space, a sort of commodity technology type company. And they had been approached by a strategic buyer who wanted to buy them for about $20 million. And the owners didn't feel it was really uh, a good value for the business because the business is doing – about two times that in revenue, and they felt that it could be more valuable uh, potentially if the company could grow. I became CEO shortly thereafter and with a mandate to try and create some value in the company. Um, after evaluating product lines, who they were selling to, what was going on in the industry, put in place a strategy that had the business growing within – uh, less than six months, and within 24 months, we went public on the NASDAQ at a $350 million valuation, did a secondary offering the following year, uh, and enabled the founding shareholders to take a substantial stake off the table. That's one example. Um, another example is a digital media company that was venture-backed, doing about $10 million of revenue, um, losing about a million and a half dollars a year, and there, the founder really wanted to see what could be done with the company because the venture capitalists that had backed the company weren't willing to put more money into it, and they had about a year of runway left. Um, there, it was a question of, again, understanding market, looking at the product set, the offering, 
um, what consumers were converting on, and rationalizing some product lines, focusing the team. We had the company profitable in under 90 days, had it growing at an 80% year-over-year growth rate within six months, had strategic offers uh, and discussions underway within nine months, and in month 13, we sold the company for um, four times revenue. 18 months later, the company was sold again uh, for a substantially higher price. This was GameSpy. Something that you were involved with before Lentronics, correct? Uh, after Lentronics. Do that. Our startup round. For all your hosting needs, head on over to MitchellChadro.com slash hosting. MitchellChadro.com slash hosting for all your web hosting needs. Who do you use to host this website? So take us to a little bit till 2014 when you basically got involved with, with local court and tell us a little bit about those challenges. Well, in the in the case of local, it wasn't so much a turnaround as it was um, trying to uh, save an asset. Uh, you know, local wasn't a story of transformation in a positive way. It really was a question of how do you um, get the company through some pretty sticky financial situations, get the assets sold, and make sure that the shareholders um, uh, you know, have an outcome of sorts. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about some of those challenges? Sure. Uh, In the case of local corporation, you had a company who really had two businesses. One was focused on the arbitrage of Google search terms, um, and the other was a syndication of a search feed from Yahoo, Microsoft. Um, Both of those businesses were businesses that, you know, you're dealing with one major partner, And that major partner is very focused on trying to um, really, you know, minimize your profitability because, you know, as I'm sure you can imagine, Google doesn't like the fact that somebody takes advantage of an inefficiency in their system to do arbitrage and make money at it. And uh, at the same time, Google is very focused on a consumer experience. And in the case of the Yahoo Bing search feed that local had, um, you're basically sub-syndicating that feed to other third parties who are then driving traffic at it. And this was right at the beginning of the period of time where uh, there started becoming a lot of fraud in the industry around uh, search and click fraud, click bots. I'm sure you've, if you follow the Internet and digital media advertising, Certainly. So you see that that's a multi, multi-billions of dollars of fraud going on in that industry year. So two businesses whose primary – um, owners, if you would, didn't want local in the business. Um, so with local, we innovated two new businesses within the company, one around programmatic trading of uh, ad impressions and one around search uh, as a platform for mobile carriers. Uh, got both of those businesses up and off the ground in under a year. Um, but part of local's challenge was also they had a need for financing, They had debt that was due, uh, which they couldn't refinance easily. Um, And it was really more of a question of how do we um, unwind this business and sell it to um, a new stakeholder who could take the assets and do something with it. So given all of these challenges, which could be, you know, an undaunting task for someone coming in Mm -hmm. like this, to tell the audience how you were able to sort of break down all of these various challenges and issues, and I think it is also helpful and insightful for, for themselves in their own dealing with their own business problems and how you were able to methodically kind of go through, sort of peel back the onion and sort of take each one as, as it approached. Sure. So um, the situation is obviously very different where you have a company that is burning money versus a company that's generating money um, because you have different runways and you have obviously different um, priorities. In the case of a company that's growing, um, it's really about understanding how can you accelerate that growth and looking at the marketplace, the products, why people are buying, how how the products are being sold, what the go-to-market model is and look where there exists friction in that model. And how can you remove friction? Can you do something to make the products more relevant to the customers, which will drive activation and drive them to buy more product or use the product more if it's a usage-based product? Um, if it's a case of, um, you know, 
finding other ways of bringing the mark the product to market to remove friction for the customer um, you know it's evaluating channels you know how are salespeople um, selling the product how is marketing promoting the product and then understand what can be done to incrementally enhance the product and then what can be done as a big move to either shift the focus of the product shift the value move up the value stack in the industry and become a more um, valuable player um, so if you look at what happened in the case of Lantronics, it was identifying a need in the marketplace for a different use of the technology. And as soon as we identified that, it was very easy to put together a strategy that allowed us to reposition, go after the market that way, and drive some very rapid revenue and value growth. And because the repositioning of the company was now viewed as strategically much better, from potential acquirers and by customers, the valuation went up um, much faster than the revenues did. You, you have your own company, Teal Advisors, and I know that yes. you work with private equity and venture capital, and you, you work with a number of boards. Can you, can you give us specific examples in terms of how you could apply that with, with the various solutions or products with, related to digitized asset businesses? Like, for example, I know you're involved in the Internet of Things and, you know, machine to machine and, and of course, you know, smart sure. systems, and maybe by giving us some concrete examples there in terms of what you're doing currently would be helpful. Sure. So as you look at, for example, one of the big issues uh, related to the Internet of Things is security. How can you ensure that somebody's not going to hack into a product and uh, use it for a bot network or use it for appropriate uses or take it hostage? Um, So, for example, if you're a manufacturer of medical devices, the last thing you would want to hear is that somebody's hacked into your system and all the insulin pumps that you manufacture have been hacked and somebody has the ability to literally um, make the products do things they shouldn't do and so now you have a, a patient issue and potentially a, a you know a major issue so there it's a question of identifying you know there was a gap in the marketplace relative to being able to secure products in the internet of things um, working with a private equity firm it, came down to finding a platform company that had a product that could be used to solve this problem, help position the products in that marketplace, and then begin to grow the market uh, from there. And um, that's one example. Another example, uh, a little bit more generic, maybe easier for people to understand is, um, if you think about one of the big reasons people are interested in the Internet of Things is to be able to better manage their assets, their factories, their plants, things like that. And if for some reason something breaks down on an assembly line and it shuts down the assembly line or a pump shuts down an oil refinery or an oil rig, these are tens of millions of dollars of cost a day for downtime, especially when it's unplanned and there are costs related to restarting the processes uh, once you fixed your problem. And so if you could just decrease the incidences of unplanned downtime, you can optimize the profitability of that factory manufacturing process and, you know, guarantee consumers that they're going to get their products on time. So there are certain components in an assembly line that are very low cost, but when they fail, they shut the whole assembly line down. So if you look at some things like that, an electric motor on a conveyor belt in a factory, if it fails, it can shut down that factory for a day until a new motor is found and and installed. But imagine if the motor could tell you when it was going to fail so that you knew a month in advance that it most probably only had about six weeks left of usable life. And so you could order a part plan to replace it during a maintenance window when the factory would be shut down anyway and not run into this unplanned downtime. And you do that by adding some Internet of Things technology to the motor that allows you to track the rate of change of vibration and temperature, which are early indicators of a potential failure. So you could take a $5,000 electric engine, add $100 of technology to it, And now that $5,000 electric engine could be potentially sold for $10,000 
because the implications of using this engine mean you will ideally have less unplanned downtime. And if you do that across multiple components of your factory, you can decrease your overall unplanned downtime and save millions and millions of dollars potentially a year. Sponsored by Inc. Head on over to mitchellchadrow.com slash Inc. I-N-D to start your business, LLC, S-Corporation, C-Corporation, or even a nonprofit. You're a startup entrepreneur, you're a sole proprietor, wanting to take your business to the next step or transition from a career to entrepreneurship, or you want more information on the different types of business entities. So again, just head on over to mitchellchadrow.com slash Inc. I-N-C. So so now, is this one of the examples for, for, for conveyor systems? Because I know that uh, you were involved with uh, Dorner Manufacturing Corporation, and, and one of the portfolio companies there was e, mm-hmm. EQT Partners. So is this a specific example that you're using, you know, based on your own experience? Or in terms of if you can provide some, some additional concrete examples, I think sure. that, would, that would help the audience as well. Sure. Yeah, so th- this is a, a, a hypothetical case. Uh, that we are applying at Dorner, yes. Um, but it has been applied other places before. Um, I sat on the board um, of a company called Prediction Software, whose product was effectively the predictive analytics um, software that you would embed in that electric engine. Uh, I see. Was sold, uh, we sold Prediction about a year and a half ago. But... Um, so it, that technology, which is called Riot, allowed you to embed predictive capabilities into end devices. And um, also in the case of another company where I was chairman for a while before it was sold, B&B Smartworks, which was owned by Graham Partners, a private equity firm out of Philadelphia. At B&B, um, the sort of whole concept was around how do we take a company that is selling uh, a fairly commoditized product uh, into the manufacturing world and make it much more value additive. And so we leveraged a lot of Internet of Things concepts to build gateways and communications devices that provided additional value, uh, allowing to better monitor and manage the systems they were connected to. And it allowed B&B to move from being a provider of a commodity technology that was more often than not an afterthought, to now being a key component in um, an operating technology solution for a factory. And that dramatically stepped up how people viewed the company, the value that its products provided, and uh, was a great example of, of value creation. Um, now, you're still involved as a senior advisor with Graham Partners? Yes. Yeah, I'm an advisor for okay. a number of private equity firms. Okay. Yeah, just because, you know, um, I'm right outside the Philadelphia area, born and mm-hmm. raised, and, and so I've, I've been involved with, you know, companies, private equity, venture capital, and, and a lot of the entrepreneurs, a lot of the startups, you know, uh, come out of, you know, Drexel University and Temple at, at Diamond Ventures. We, we've had people on the show who have startups. So h- how are you working with maybe some of the tri-state, local, you know, young entrepreneurs and, and basically helping them take their businesses to the next level? Sure. So um, I have limited bandwidth for startups, so I typically work with no more than four or five startup teams and or startup companies or CEOs. Um, in mentoring them in really understanding how to achieve very rapid product market fit and then innovating to eventually what becomes the kind of final product that you're building and releasing. Um, I've developed over the years a framework that I call the six A's um, just because uh, A is an easy letter to remember and there just happen to be <laughs> six words to start with A that make up this. But um, if you think about um, – as most people say, as the old adage goes, you know, begin with the end in mind. So if you're building a product, what you're really trying to do is solve a problem, remove an inefficiency, remove friction from some process or some transaction or some aspect of people's lives. And um, a product is only successful when users activate the product, meaning they use it. Um, if you can drive user activation, in the online world, it means you're getting people to subscribe to your product or your service. Um, in the physical products world, it's people are buying your product, and not only are they buying it, but they're actually using it. And so if you were Netflix, for example, user activation is a combination of how many people have signed up and then how many hours a month are they watching on the platform. To get 
customers and users to activate, they have to be amazed. They have to have had a really amazing experience because there are all sorts of competitors out there that can offer similar outcomes. Um, and it's a question of how do you provide the best outcome for your target consumer? Uh, for example, if the Uber app were kludgy to use and inefficient, they would never have gotten where they are today. But what Uber did very successfully was they realized that all they had to do was make it effectively commoditize the ability to get a hold of transportation in a very user-friendly and efficient way that provided a high degree of certainty that you get a car, it'd be a nice car, and you get to where you're going. And then the rest was simply execution in providing the service. So if you can provide an amazing user experience, you can activate users and drive revenues. So how do you create an amazing user experience? Well, you have to look at whatever process you're dealing with and remove the manual steps, so you have to automate it. You have to accelerate it, which is shorten the time it takes for a user to get value out of it. You have to make the product anticipate what the user is going to want or need to do so that you can make it even more of a surprising experience for the user. Uh, for example, if companies like Amazon and Netflix that have huge pools of content didn't have recommendation engines that told you what you might want to watch or what you might want to buy based on what you are watching or are buying, then it would be much more difficult for people to transact business because they'd come in, buy one product, and leave, and in this way now those services can upsell people to other programming, other products, et cetera, and grow the business. So what are, what are some products and solutions you're working on right now that, that integrates the predictive type of model to, to basically create a better experience for, for those uh, consumers out there? Sure. So uh, one example is a safety product for distracted drivers. Um, and if you can imagine that the – there are two kind of uh, people who are very focused on not wanting to have distracted drivers. One are parents. They don't want their teens being distracted when they drive because distracted driving is one of the single highest uh, causes of traffic fatalities in teens. The other are commercial fleet owners, people who own fleets of vehicles or who have fleets of vehicles driving on their behalf, whether it's for delivery or service, who want to remove the liability of a driver potentially being on their phone, uh, looking at Snapchat or Facebook and running over somebody in a crosswalk and then having that person's family sue the company whose truck that person was driving uh, because they were on the clock, so to say, while they were driving and they were a distracted driver. So uh, the distracted driving industry is one where um, there is a lot of value to be provided. If you can find a way to create a friendly experience for the user so they don't feel that somebody has put handcuffs on them. And so uh, I'm working with a company that um, will be announcing its products very shortly. Um, we're specifically, we've designed a product uh, that makes it very simple to define um, the driver's seat, if you would, in a vehicle, so that you can differentiate between somebody who's the driver and somebody who's the passenger, and then automatically switch the capabilities on their phone so that they either um, are warned and you report back to the parent and or employer anytime that person uses an app or handles the phone in a way that could be deemed as distracted driving, um, so that the parent and or employer can go back and tell the person who is using the phone, hey, you know, you used your phone 16 times today while you were driving. That's a no-no. Um, Additionally, the product can um, effectively block the user from using apps if you want to take that much of a stronger position on it. Um, and this is a great way to provide uh, an ability for increased safety uh, in team drivers, in less distracted driving in commercial drivers, reduce overall accidents, and do it in a way so that the parents and the employers through behavioral uh, tools can re-educate the drivers. Uh, it also lets them control the driver's access to apps and what they can do while they're driving. 
Um, and the same thing can be applied in classrooms, church, offices, meetings, wherever you want. It's just a question of defining what area you don't want somebody being distracted in, and uh, the service can do that. But the key is very simple to configure, very simple to use, um, focus on really the social um, pressure and sort of neuromarketing aspect of how do you get people to change their behavior simply by them understanding they are being inspected. And it's another old adage, you know, people respect what you inspect. And if mm. a driver knows that every time they accelerate, that's being tracked. When they brake, that's being tracked. When they turn, that's being tracked. And so, you know, you can tell if somebody's driving in the distracted mode. And you can also, by understanding what somebody's doing on their phone at any given moment, if the car is in motion and they are in the driver's seat and they happen to be looking at Snapchat, you know all that information. And you can choose to either block it, um, effectively make the app unusable while the car is moving uh, and they're in the driver's seat, or simply report it and let the driver as well as whoever's responsible on the other end, know, hey, you know, use the app while you're driving, you shouldn't do that, you know, one point off, whatever it might be. And then uh, the responsible adult can uh, you know, deal with it in whatever mode they want to deal with it. Uh, sure. A lot of interest from insurance companies, a lot of interest from fleet owners, a lot of interest from parents, obviously, uh, driver sure. safety organizations, uh, and even car manufacturers love the idea because, you know, they clearly – would love to have a world where people don't die driving their cars. Absolutely. Our fast pitch, mitchellchadro.com slash books for books, audio books, guest recommendations, and the books that I read to start up each day. Sponsors are Fast Pitch, my book club recommendations back at mitchellchadro.com slash books. To see more of my recommendations and recommendations of our guests, just go to mitchellchadro.com slash books. It's your number one resource for book reviews and recommendations. In this next round, we actually call it our Fast Pitch, where we ask you some fast questions to get some fast answers, and it gives us a, another dynamic of, of who you are, Fred, as not only as a business person, but but maybe, you know, personally and life in general. So can you tell us the best business advice you've ever received? Uh, the best business advice I've ever received is um, ask questions. Don't tell people what to do. Great. And as far as success goes, you know, everybody defines success differently. A, how do you define success? And then B, can you tell us someone that you kind of look up to that maybe – you know, you've modeled after or you've uh, gained some insight from in terms of who you consider to be successful? Sure. Um, so success is a very big topic, but I'll try and make it <laughs> very short. <laughs> right? Um, <you laughs> right. Know, success for me is um, being able to um, live and execute a purpose that um, might just be a journey, it might not be an end goal. Um, and being able to do that, uh, live or execute a purpose, um, for me is a great definition of success, whether it's raise a set of kids that are balanced, whether it's create a company that's very valuable, whether it's provide a service to society that helps people and lifts them out of poverty or helps educate them. Um, whatever the the journey is, being able to do that and make progress on that journey is sort of what I view as successful. Yeah, sure. And as far as someone successful that, that you kind of have admired or, you know, kind of have looked up to possibly o over these decades? Sure. Um, different people for different things. Um, you know, I am a huge fan of Winston Churchill. And oh, so yeah. Ability to motivate people and get people around a common goal who otherwise might not have common interests and get them to go over and above the call of duty to do what's required to achieve that outcome, provided it's the right thing for society, good for the people involved, etc. Um, you know, war is never a good thing, but Winston Churchill was amazing at motivating people and being a leader. 
Well, you years know, that kind of takes me into my next question because, and I, and I think you, you know, you could use anything as an example, although I'm sure you could probably find a lot of good examples using Winston Churchill, but how about an inspirational quote or some type of a mantra that you, you always kind of go back to in, in times of challenge or just to kind of be mindful or resourceful? Um, well, I mean, something that I always think about, um, and it's not a specific person I can attribute a quote to, but it's more a concept that um, I have sort of found uh, in listening to a variety of people, and that is that we fear that which we don't know. But once we know it, we know we can overcome it. Hmm. And so instead of being afraid and worrying Apply that energy to finding the answers to the questions that you don't have answers to that would help you figure out, is it a threat, isn't it? How big of a threat is it or not? What are things you could do to eliminate the threat? And so if you ask yourself questions, you can focus your mind in the areas where you're going to be most productive and make the most headway. So not getting tied up in being afraid or paranoid, but rather asking yourself questions of what do I know, what don't I know, what do I need to know to be able to do whatever it is I'm doing. And whether your uh, competition is hammering you in the marketplace, if you don't have data, you can't act. You need data to act. Go find the data, then you can make decisions. It's um, you know, a combination of military and corporate strategy kind of all glommed together. But yeah. if you have data... There's no reason to be afraid because you can act. I, I love it. It's great, Fred. No, that, that's terrific. And I, and I think that uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs, startups, and, and those that are on the fence, you know, with a side hustle and deciding, you know, to, to sort of, you know, make that leap, I, I think that uh, they can really draw on a lot of those things that you've just mentioned. Can you, can you tell us um, a, a book? Uh, could be in business, uh, family, or life that that you always uh, sort of go back to that you that you really have enjoyed. Um, I love only the paranoid survive by Andy. Ah, Grove. yes, Mr. Andy Grove, and uh, I, I've I've not only read that book, but I, I I love the name of that book. Yeah, it, it's you know it's on that theme that we just talked about. Um, so that, that's clearly one. Um, and then really, uh, you know, Purpose Driven Life, I think, was a great book, um, not because of its religious overtones, but more just because of the fact if you, you know, you, you can have material goals, uh, you can have physical goals, but if you have a purpose, um, you never really get, it's not a place you get to, it's a lifelong journey. And so if you can figure out what your life's purpose is, what your career purpose is, then uh, it's very easy to find a way to be satisfied and really drive um, the outcomes that you want to achieve in life, um, as opposed to just seeking material goals where, you know, if you talk to most successful people, when they were at their most successful is when they kind of felt the emptiest because they had reached the end of a journey and they didn't know where to go or what to do. Um, but if you really understand what your purpose is, uh, then it's a place you never get to. You, it's a journey that you live. And uh, we talked a lot about smart systems, and we talked a lot about Internet of Things. I know that you even referenced apps. So if you could tell us an app that you could recommend to the audience, I think that would be that would be great. It doesn't have to be just productivity. It could be an app, whether it be in business, family, or life. I, I mean. Uh, I'd say there, there are a few of them. One is Headspace, which is a meditation app that takes you through yes. guided meditation. Uh, you know, it, meditation is really all about helping you still the mind, uh, get the squirrel off the wheel, if you would, and uh, allow you to focus. And, um, you know, there are two things, if you're in business, that are important. One is resources. And the other is time. You can always get more resources. You can't get more time. And so really m making good use of time is critical for an entrepreneur, no matter what size of business it is. It's critical for a parent or critical in any role in life. Our wrap-up round, MitchellChadrow.com slash 
photos for all your graphic design needs. As we'd like to find out from your perspective three main takeaways and then how everybody can stay in contact with you. Sure. Um, so I think uh, three main takeaways. So one is get data, ask lots of questions. Don't make assumptions. Um, why is that important? It's important because if you're sitting around a conference room table and people are telling you what they think uh, versus what they know, and you can only say you know something when you have the data in front of you, um, you're going to get um, really, you know, uh, hypotheses and assumptions. You're not going to get true fact, and you'll likely make poor decisions. So ask a lot of questions, get the data, then act. Um, so that's definitely one takeaway. The other is there is always a way to create value in anything you do, whether it's uh, having a conversation with somebody on the subway or whether it's turning around a company or building uh, an amazing enterprise um, or raising a family. It's if you approach life from a focus of how do I add value um, in all aspects, in any conversation, in any interaction, no matter what it is, you will always come out feeling um, positive, having experienced some growth, and you'll have made a mark on a person, a company, a society, um, or the world uh, as a whole. Um, and then lastly, realize that everybody is fallible. Nobody is perfect, least of all yourself, and that the only way to really advance is through failure. Failure is a very good thing, and you should embrace it. So those are three three core takeaways uh, that I've certainly learned a lot from. So, Fred, everybody wants to stay in contact. Sure. Um, you can either follow me on Twitter, at FGTeal, so letter F, like in Fred, G like in George, and then T-H-I-E-L. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. My email address is fred at tealadvisors.com, and that's T-H-I-E-L-A-D-V-I-S-O-R-S.com. Um, and uh, through any one of those three, you can get a hold of me and be more than happy to engage and uh, have a conversation. Fred, there's been so many awesome value bombs that you provided our Listen Up audience, and we just want to thank you so very much. And we can't wait to, to find out uh, some of the other things that you're working on, and we'll, we'll definitely be in touch. Thanks again for everything. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, you take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. To listen up last show, that's mitchellchadro.com slash show 044, and get the show notes and resource links. Go to mitchellchadro.com slash show 044 with Nancy May. Until next time, take care, everyone. In closing, let me ask for my listeners' help. First, please subscribe to my email list at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. You will get all the full interview transcripts, my ebook, 30 Tools to Start Up, where I talk about these free resources in show 006. You'll get the startup checklist, education and training materials, and other resources just by signing up at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. Back at MitchellChadro.com slash sign up, help me boost the rankings of the Listen Up Show, the Startup Entrepreneur Podcast, by providing a well-written review in iTunes. MitchellChadro.com slash iTunes. It helps other people find the show. If you actually need instructions on how to do this, you can find that back at MitchellChadro.com slash sign up. Thank you so much for subscribing to my email list and providing a written review on iTunes. Until next time.